This is the Improved Photography Podcast, episode number 184. This episode is brought to you by a fella named Brent who rents lenses. His website, Brent brentrentslenses.com um, is a great way to find the lenses that you need or cameras uh, for an interesting shoot, somewhere, something you want to try out some new gear on. Uh, check it out at brentrentslenses.com and use offer code IMPROVE to get 15% off your first rental. Hey everybody and welcome back to the Improved Photography Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Harmer, and I am very glad to be back after a two-week paternity leave. My wife uh, had a baby, Faith Harmer, uh, two weeks ago, and she has been sleeping like a champ, so we decided to keep her. <laughs> and uh, so we, I just did a, a newborn photography shoot on Facebook Live for those of you who are watching a little bit earlier today, uh, but I am glad to be back here. And today I'm joined by Jeff Harmon. Sandy Duro and Connor Hibbs. Hey guys. Hey. Hello. Hello. Well, uh, tons has been going on. I've been yelling into my earbuds as I've been listening to you guys sometimes with things that I don't agree with. <laughs> I know all of you always say that every time we come back to, uh, yeah. if you miss an episode and then you come back, it's like, you guys were so wrong about this or that or the other. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was fun to listen to you guys. You got some great episodes coming out. But we had a couple questions uh, from the community. Jenny Wu says, when I'm round tripping, Photoshop saves the image as a tiff before going going back to Lightroom, am I losing flexibility of a raw file at that point? What do you guys think? I thought that TIFFs were, had just as much information, well, as a Photoshop file. They're close. <laughs> They're really close. So what the biggest difference is a TIFF is 8-bit and Photoshop will be 16-bit or a raw file 16-bit. So there is a little bit of, of color information that won't be as quite as flexible, but it's super, super close. Like you're not, it's not terrible to go into to Photoshop round trip back and have a TIFF. I do occasionally save to PSD rather than having it auto save to TIFF uh, to preserve my layer stuff. I know you can do layered TIFFs and I actually did a test just today because I saw a question. I wanted to see the difference. The file size actually comes out to be exactly the same too between a PSD and a TIFF. But the PSD is a native format, and like I said, 16-bit. You can get some TIFFs that are also 16-bit, but the general use of it is only 8-bit. So it's there is a little bit of difference. It's not enough to be worried about, I don't think, but there is a little bit of difference between a raw file and that TIFF. Yeah, so yeah, the, I feel, uh, go ahead, Connor. I feel like I, I read something about this, too, where she was saying that she was trying to bring it back into, vote, or into Lightroom and then add more corrections on top sure. of it. And my recommendation, if you're going to do that, is to do a PSD rather than a TIFF, only because you have that 16-bit color depth and you're not going to be crunching anything more. I, I have no issues with 8-bit. However, I feel like that should kind of be, if you're going to be crunching down to an 8-bit color depth, that should be when you're finalizing your image, um, not while you're in the middle of editing it. So how do you do that? How do you tell Lightroom to save it as a PSD? Or excuse um, me, it, yeah. So, so you can actually just do that through the preferences. I have mine set up so it automatically will save as a PSD. Although I believe that when you are saving, instead of just hitting Command or Control S to save it back to Lightroom, if you say um, Command Shift S or Control Shift S, you can save as and save it as a PSD if it naturally saves as a TIFF and you happen to want to maintain it as a PSD for this individual file. Right. I think most people just hit the X on the tab in Photoshop to... And then it says, do you want to save? You say yes, and it round trips it back into Lightroom. If instead of hitting the X, you either you do a save a file, save as, or control shift S, command shift S, save as, you can say oh, you wanted a PSD format. And then Lightroom still reads those in great. You still It still goes back into Lightroom. You can still do everything you can with it in Lightroom. So I, I prefer that occasionally if I have layers. If, if there's not a bunch of layers that I care about preserving, the TIFF is just fine. Yeah. yeah, I usually set mine to to do the PSD instead of the TIFF uh, when I'm round tripping. The only real reason to choose the TIFF is that in theory, it's going to be more future proof because it's an open format, right. uh, whereas yeah. the PSD is a is a, you know, a proprietary to Photoshop. 
But and of course, I, I don't know that that have... really matters because, no. I mean, you know how many PSD files there are in the world? And do you know <laughs> how quickly everybody would dump on Adobe if suddenly we moved to something else and they didn't create a tool to move them over? I mean, I mean that's just inconceivable that that could ever occur. Uh, and, and even if they didn't make it, somebody else would uh, make, a, make it so that you could always convert it to whatever the new thing is we use 20 years from now. So I see PSD as being the better format. It may use a little bit more more disk space, but I just don't worry about that. Just buy another hard drive. They're cheap. Um, so I usually go with the PSD for that reason. But I, I the workflow that I like best for to totally avoid this problem is open the photo in Lightroom, make any uh, global exposure changes you want to make right off the bat so that you're getting all the advantage of the RAW file to start with. Then, if you're going to need to do deep surgery in the picture, take it into Photoshop, do the deep surgery, and then immediately go back to Lightroom to just do your stylization and stuff. That way you get the advantage of the RAW file where it actually matters when you're working with exposure. Um, and then at that point, you're working on a PSD or a TIFF to do your stylization. And I mean, let's be honest, you can't really even tell the difference. There's no, no. way you can tell the difference if you're no. just stylizing the photo. You know, we're not doing the big right. ex big... Uh, exposure changes. We're just doing a little stylization. You're not gonna know if you're working on a PSD, a TIFF, or or the RAW file at that point. Uh, so right. so I that that's the workflow that makes the most sense to me. The you know, only other the, the only reason to use a TIFF, sorry, sorry, Sandy, um, is if you're not round tripping from Photoshop. If you're using a different Lightroom plugin to get to a different app, then of course coming back, really the only choice you're going to have is TIFF because again, now that's a universal kind of format which will work between lots of different vendor programs, not Adobe. So when you round trip to something else besides Photoshop and come back, you have a TIFF and they're great. They're very high quality, as close to raw as you can get kind of format. You know, at the commercial studio, we always we work exclusively with TIFFs, and I'm and I never really questioned it before because I knew that it was again you're not going to be able to tell. But now I'm curious, you know, because if you're if you're making a photo that's going to go to like a graphic artist for an advertisement or something, if they would you know be able to use a TIFF versus a, a PSD, if they're using you know a different kind of software program that right. we don't use because we're not graphic like designers. Paint. <laughs> yeah <laughs> just the really classy ones i think that paint. a tip would probably crash paint right like <laughs> these file sizes all right kevin jordan says can you guys convince me why i need to spend uh four hundred dollars plus on an expensive tripod i'm having a tough time understanding why i'd need to spend that much so he's getting the four hundred dollar mark uh because on improvephotography.com if you click on recommended gear where i know a lot of you guys start your shopping as you're looking for um, for new gear, just to kind of see uh, some of the recommendations that we have. Um, anyway, the, the tripod that I recommend is the Faisal, and it's $400 on there. I, I totally get it. I, I've i been there. I totally know why you look at these tripods, and it's like, come on. It holds the camera up. Why do I need to spend this much money? <laughs> I've totally been there. And honestly, I hear all kinds of reasons about, like, stability. I want to make sure I don't, you know, get uh, any blur in the photo, even with a super long exposure. And I don't think that's the reason to spend $400 on a tripod. You can get a $100 tripod. In fact, we have a recommendation on improvephotography.com in the recommended gear. Just click tripod. Uh, for an excellent, inexpensive tripod, you will not have problems with your camera uh, shaking any more, I mean, really, than you would with a $400 tripod. Maybe a tiny different. I mean, it's the same thing. You're going to get a nice, solid, sharp exposure. You shouldn't be having problems as long as you have a decent tripod and ball head. So for me, that's not a good reason to do it. The reason that I finally broke down is I looked in the corner of my room and saw like six tripods there. You know, the one that I bought that was cheap, then the next one, then the next one. The ball head starts getting wobbly and eventually you keep buying them. And I said, okay, I'm going to get one that's going to last forever. Um, and, and so I, I finally bought it. So for me, it's that, it's the durability. And the other thing is, uh, if you're only using a tripod two or three times a year when you go on a major trip and most of the time you're just shooting a handheld, shooting family and stuff, it's probably not worth it. If you're the weekend warrior and you're constantly out shooting every Saturday, you know, getting out there in the sticks and, and shooting, shooting landscapes and stuff, then it's just more convenient to use the 
more expensive tripods. The leg locks lock the first time and quickly. They set up easier. They'll usually get smaller and be lighter. Just little features like that that are nice for portability and convenience. So for me, the reason is portability is convenience and durability. It really has nothing to do with image quality for me. What do you guys think? So as the hobbyist here who doesn't spend that kind of money on his gear, uh, yeah, I've been living with an enduro tripod that's, I think, recommended out on the Proof Photography site, too. It was like $150. It was less than $200, uh, which felt like a lot when I was buying it compared to the $35 ones in Walmart. But, but uh, that one's been great. I've had it for four years now, and no problem. It's not as smooth a ball head uh, mount as, as those expensive ones. It takes a little bit more doing to get the composition just how you want because when you let go of the tightening clamp th lever thing, it, it'll settle some. You know, there's, there's some things that are definite disadvantages to it, but it still holds the camera plenty still so that I can get really good, clear, sharp uh, landscape shots. So I, it's great. Yeah. I'll add I, in I one love. thing on this. Um, Nick and I have been talking tripods quite a lot uh, on the podcast. Um, I'm using the really right stuff, the BH40, the middle size one. And Nick got the Acrotech ball head. And we mentioned on the podcast a while ago that we were going to try each other's uh, ball heads and, and see uh, which one was best. And I would say that if I were buying today, I probably would buy Nick's. I would probably get the Acrotech GP um, instead of the really right stuff. It seems like it's just as good in terms of the durability. They're the same weight, uh, similar price. The Acrotech's a little bit more, um, but I, I, the Acrotech has a lot more features. And so since everything else is about equal, I, I'd probably go that way uh, if you're looking at, at the expensive ball heads. Coincidentally, yeah. I, would, I would rather sp spend the money on the expensive ball head than the expensive tripod. Like if you only have yeah. the budget for one of them first, I'd probably go with a, a nice ball head and put it on a less sure. expensive tripod. Well, he said to convince him. So if he's if he's happy with what he has, I, I have a two hundred dollar. It's like a Surrey. I don't know how you pronounce Surrey, it. Yeah. Surrey, um, and I love it. I think that it's great. And the reason that I upgraded was because I like you know had an epic temper tantrum because my Walmart one was I was trying to do like a, <laughs> a panorama and my camera's just like barely hanging off the side and it right. was terrible. So if he, I mean that I think that's when you need need to upgrade is when what you have isn't working for you. So what what are you using now? Yeah. You know, definitely worth getting out of that thirty five dollar <laughs> version. Um, it's there's, like the there's... most maddening thing on the planet. Yeah, it is. They and they don't last. You you'll go through them like crazy anyway. You'll if you use them at all for landscape if you are going to uh destinations at all traveling with it it's going to break so it's worth spending a hundred to two hundred dollars on a tripod i don't you don't have to go all the way to 400 to get something decent but um it's worth going up from that 35 dollar range that's a good point don't spend less than 120 bucks uh you, yeah. you can spend a lot more but but don't spend less because under that you're definitely going to be rebuying and buy and paying more because you had to buy more than one tripod but a lot of people are going to be happy with the $120 tripod. They don't use it that much or it just doesn't bother them. And awesome. Keep it. There's no real reason to invest otherwise. If it's not broken, don't fix it. That's right. Okay, let's get on to our spiels for the day. Um, today, I want to talk about music. Okay, the other day <laughs> when I was on, actually maybe the last time that I was on, I, talk, I, I read everybody poetry. Now it is music. Yes. <laughs> so right. I, I'm not trying to get philosophical on everybody, but it, I've just I've just had some uh, epiphanies about photography that have really been helpful for me lately. Uh, so this is one that I was thinking about this week. So uh, Emily and I went out to uh, a little music thing, uh, some piano thing um, at a local restaurant this weekend. And Emily loves playing the piano, loves music, and so she, uh, she's just in her element there. And the guy was taking requests. The pianist was, you know, people could, you know, give a tip and, and put uh, put in whatever you want, whatever song. We suggested Piano Man, Billy Joel, by the way, bring it back the old days. Um, and it was really cool uh, to watch him. And, and Emily, Emily plays the piano, uh, but she she can't, you know, uh, do the thing where you just kind of improv and just make up the song because you've heard it on the radio. That just doesn't work in her head. Uh, and she was talking about how, uh, how man, she just really wishes she could, she could do that, that she could, you know, just, just sit down to the piano and spring out a song because you've heard it on the radio. And there, there are definitely people that, that can do that. 
But there are also really talented musicians, uh, incredible musicians, who can't do that. And I was the same way. So I did choir all through school and, and even into college. And I, I did a lot of it. I loved all the music stuff. I was in band too, played the little trumpet. Um, but I hated, absolutely hated uh, doing improv, like in, in jazz band and jazz choir and scat. It's just, it's just not my personality. It made me feel very uncomfortable. I'd rather just have the notes on the page and play them. It was just more fun for me. I, I just felt more comfortable with that. Um, and so Emily and I were talking anyway, and we, we kind of realized that there are just two different approaches uh, to music. And some people do that, and some people don't. Some people like to have the music on the page, and they're incredible, world-renowned musicians, but they just don't do the improv. Okay, long explanation to get to this point. Uh, <laughs> lately, I've noticed a lot of photographers kind of talking down um, to those who uh, like to have kind of a set photo location that they go to and shoot. Uh, and I often hear people saying things like, you know, uh, well, if you are a really good photographer, you can make any, any, uh, any situation look good. I, uh, so I can, I can kind of understand, uh, what they mean by that, but I, I guess I don't want people to feel bad, uh, who don't really feel like they have that skill to just like walk around and poof, come up with all these crazy <laughs> ideas and, and make this crazy shoot in, you know, somebody's basement, right? Some people are skilled with that and others just aren't, but it doesn't mean you're a bad photographer. And so today I wanted to just give a little encouragement uh, to those of you who kind of feel like you need like a location to shoot uh, or I'm practicing a technique today um, instead of just kind of like free forming it all the time. Uh, you shouldn't feel like you're, you're a substandard photographer because of it. It's just a totally different style. And I think it also has a lot to do with your personality. So that is what I have to say. Do you guys agree with that? Or do you believe that the best photographers are going to be the ones that can, that can make it up on the spot? No. I, I, ha I I have something to say, but I'll let Connor go first. <laughs> I, I don't see any reason why it would be a bad thing to feel like you have to plan something out beforehand. I mean, that could – this just makes me so mad to think about. I'm sorry. I'm getting kind of tongue-tied because it seems absurd to me. Yeah, some people can totally go to a place and just – wing it and get great results from it. But that's the way that they work. That's probably the way they've learned how to work over years and it's taken lots of practice. And if somebody practices, practices really intentional location scouting and going there and setting it up and getting exactly the shot that they had in their mind, then great. If you're getting a good shot, you're getting a good shot. Who cares? I think I, there's... Oh, go ahead, Sandy. You had, I'm go so ahead. sorry. I, I, have, take, no, I take issue turn. with anybody's... <laughs> I take issue with anybody that says you have to do it my way or you're not a real photographer because you do yeah. this or oh, you should be charging this or you should be doing that. Like, my, why don't you focus on what you have going on? Why are you being so, you know, hateful towards <laughs> other photographers? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Well, so I think there's huge value to the people who can really get technical and even precise. Like I've seen some photos where they'll have the same scene in two different seasons, the exact yeah. same scene in two different seasons. And they'll, they'll like split it diagonally or somehow they'll split it. Maybe even just kind of a low, a, a slow fade between the two using maybe like a gradient mask or something in, in Photoshop. Super cool photos to be able to do that. And that would take some huge discipline to go to a site and figure out how to market so that you can take the exact same photo and get them to line up and, and get them to look right. Uh, those are really compelling photos too. It doesn't just have to be craziness when you get there yeah. to figure out how I'm going to get a picture that doesn't look like anybody else's from this same spot. Well, good then. Sounds like we're all on board with this. So I, I, I just hear this. I heard it at the conference that I was at a couple of weeks ago, uh, especially. I heard several people making comments about, um, you know, um, about, you know, if you're a really good photographer, you can take an average scene and make it look great. And I just... I don't always think that, that that's true. That's one photography technique. It's, it doesn't mean that you're the best photographer because you have that specific technique. It's, uh, I, 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 uh, I, I just think there, there are different types, and I think that's just one of the skills. 
All right, right Connor, you you. Um, you had some big news come out this week. Uh, you have been working hard behind the scenes on a new video tutorial that is available on Improved Photography Plus. Uh, those of you that have a subscription over there, that's our uh, website at improvephotographyplus.com. Uh, it has a two-week free trial, so you can go check it out. Uh, but then it's twenty dollars a month, nineteen ninety five, whatever, um, and you get access to basically everything that Improve Photography does, at least all our our downloadable products. And Connor's been been uh, hard at work behind the scenes, uh, showing his his post processing technique, his full workflow uh, for high end retouching techniques. A lot of you have been asking for more advanced information on Improve Photography Plus, and so here it is coming at you. This, and we have several more, uh, and I just released Lightroom Medic on there as well. Uh, so there are, are quite a few more advanced tutorials coming. So I, I guess today I'm excited to hear about some of your uh, some of your retouching stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you said, this is something that I've worked pretty hard on. It's really kind of an amalgamation of techniques that I've pulled together over years of studying retouching. Um, when I got into photography, a big part of the reason I did was because I was interested in the retouching side of things. So I, I have kind of a basic workflow that I use just going through Lightroom. In fact, your brushes, Jim, are awesome. Those are also available on Improved Photography Plus. Oh, the, um, the Lightroom brushes. So we have tons of yes. presets on there, but a lot of people have missed that we also have brushes uh, for Lightroom that you can go in and, and, and brush in different effects on the face. Yeah, and, and especially for kind of a basic, something that you're doing really quickly, those brushes are now my go-to. They're awesome. But for anything that I'm trying to get a little bit more in-depth with, I do a lot of headshots, and a lot of those are kind of acting headshots where they want to look their best in front of people that are going to give them their job or not. Um, but a big part of this is that you don't want them to look plasticky. So a, a thing that I find is kind of common with retouching is that people end up going too far and pushing things just to a point where it doesn't look quite real. And all of this course is kind of focused on how to get techniques or using techniques to get realistic looking results that just make somebody look like their best fresh self rather than this plasticky perfect model. Um, something else that I kind of wanted to talk about here is a new feature that's been opened up in Lightroom as of re what was it last week, Jeff? Like, yeah, I think it was last yes. week. Yep. So in this most recent release of Photoshop, they have a face detect capability in the liquify tool in Photoshop. So it's the same liquify tool that they had before, but however, now it can actually tell where eyes, nose, mouth are. And from what it looks like, you can kind of manipulate those things. You can make the eyes look large and cartoonish or maybe tweak a smile out of a straight face. And it's something that just like pushing it too far and going plasticky, I'm kind of worried about this tool because I feel like a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily go in to liquefy before are now going to feel like they have the complete tool that they need to be able to change someone's face to make it look natural and already retouching is something that can kind of get a bad rap sometimes, like especially when you see with these stars that have, I don't know, a side that's pulled in and then underneath their arm that side is very obviously much wider. Um, what do you guys think? Is, is this something that I'm overreacting about or do you think that there really is some danger here in the way that people are going to use this new feature? I think you're Where's... overreacting. <laughs> <laughs> He's very I mean, serious. I mean, He's very been, serious. There have been so many crazy tools in Photoshop <laughs> and each time you see, we see them, it's like, Ooh, what's that going to become? You know, <laughs> as soon as I de saw D Hayes, my first thought was, oh man, everybody has a foggy morning shot for the next two years, but it's fine. Like uh, we see them and uh, you know, there's always, uh, always the overdone effect of anything, but I don't, I don't see this one as being, uh, being, as big of a deal, I guess. In fact, I think it could help because before it would, you know, it kind of looking like the elephant man when you use the liquify tool <laughs> and weren't great with it. And this will, this yeah. will help to make it look right. I, I think that that's a valid yeah. point for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, maybe I am overreacting just a little bit. I'm a little bit sensitive when it comes to the retouching topic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sensitive about my Photoshop tools. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The way I've seen it demoed, it, it looked like it could be really helpful. You, you have some people who, they, like the ones I saw was was changing the smile, making it so yeah. they have a bit more of a smile. 
And of course you can take it too far and they'll look just absolutely silly <laughs> and ridiculous and and people will probably try that thinking it looks good because everyone goes overboard on, on a new feature when it first is released. But uh, but to have that capability to make it look really natural and and change it like that, if a customer asks, I mean, yeah. people were doing it anyway. The liquid, it's they didn't really change your abilities to use the liquify tool. It's just automating it a lot more. So you you it draw it detects the facial features for you now, and you can through like drop downs have have uh, Photoshop change it for you rather than you have to figure out how to use. The raw liquify tool, which is still there, but um, but that it, it's kind of a nice way to make it so that people can use it. I think even more responsibly. So hopefully that'll be the effect rather than going overboard. And for it. for those of you who are maybe listening to this discussion a little bit confused, if you're a little bit newer in Photoshop, the liquify tool is basically what you would use to make things larger or smaller, like specific areas of the of the photo. Uh, you know, if you somebody has a big nose, you could put the circle over their nose and whoop, just shrink it in. Um, there are some obvious uses on human anatomy where people often use that. Um, <laughs> but you, And then you can also smush things in. Like, you know, you could take uh, somebody's, somebody's jaw, if it, they have kind of a weak jaw, you could kind of explain expand it out in a spot uh, it's just you know it's the nip tuck tool you know this is this is plastic surgery in photoshop uh, so that's kind of what we're talking about that's a really good analogy i'm going to use that the nip tuck tool <laughs> yeah okay you've kind of calmed my nerves a bit about this i feel a little <laughs> bit better you'll now. be able to <laughs> sleep better tonight yes <laughs> Oh, very cool. Well, we have lots more to talk about in this episode, but before we do, we want to take a second and thank a couple companies that have made the Improved Photography podcast possible. And the first one is The Great Courses Plus. Uh, I've been using The Great Courses for a long time. Um, basically, what it is is it's just the very best uh, professors and teachers in all kinds of different areas uh, who come together and present, you know, their their master class or their one hundred and one, their their uh, kind of give it all in in one uh, one setting, um, and and it's available in video on thegreatcoursesplus.com. It has tons and tons of content available, um, f- starting at fourteen ninety nine a month. Um, but if you go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash improve, um, you can uh, get a one-month free trial. So that's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash improve. They have courses on just about everything. Uh, I mean, they have courses on everything from uh, history, science, uh, uh, professional and personal development, health, fitness, nutrition, travel, food and wine, uh, hobby and leisure, music, fine arts, and of course, uh, photography. I have some great uh, courses on there from a National Geographic photographer. So that's at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash improve. You can sign up for your free trial. Uh, it's a great deal. Go to improve to the great courses dot the great courses plus dot com slash improve and sign up today. And we thank them for supporting the podcast. And also by Casper Mattress. Casper is what makes me look less tired on these podcasts if you're <laughs> watching the video. So I'm picky about about my mattress. I really shouldn't be, but I am. Um, and we have tried all kinds of different different mattresses. We've moved 12 times. Emily and I have moved 12 times in the last three years, in the last nine years. Sorry, that would be crazy. Uh, 12 times in the last nine years. And we're finally in a house where we're going to stay. So we've moved uh, and a lot of times we just leave our old mattress behind because it's junk and we get them on Amazon and Craigslist and wherever getting getting different mass mattresses and let me tell you we've had some horrible ones and so I've become a little bit picky um, but recently we we upgraded to a king bed and I went to casper.com on the rec- on the recommendation of my sister-in-law who tried it uh, for under a thousand bucks. You're getting a king size mattress for 950 bucks. It ships right to your house. Uh, they have a great warranty on on the uh, on the mattress. It's a hundred nights risk free. Uh, you can try it. 
Um, and it's really cool. Uh, it, if, if I, let's see if I could describe it. Uh, they call it like the one mattress that fits everybody. Uh, and everybody kind of has their personal taste, but it's like, I would say it's more on the firm side if you're used to a coil mattress, uh, but it's on the softer side if you're used to a normal uh, memory foam mattress. It's kind of kind of in, in between the two. It's, it's a firm memory foam, but a little bit on the, on the softer side of what you'll get from most memory foam mattresses. Uh, so anyway, we've really liked it and it's super inexpensive. Uh, I, but we bought ours before they even started sponsoring on the podcast. So I was ex- excited to see them come on. Uh, you can get 50 bucks, uh, toward any mattress purchase by going to casper.com slash improve. That's $50 toward any mattress at casper.com slash improve. And, uh, we thank them also for their support of the podcast. All right. Uh, Sandy, uh, what do you have for us in your spiel today? We, Hey, by the oh. way, we, we Googled how to spell spiel and it's actually oh. like S P I E L never knew it. <laughs> and now, you know. <laughs> um, so the thing that got me thinking about um, my topic was I was um, cleaning out all of my my photography stuff that I haven't used in a long time and I realized that I had a bunch of the little small soft boxes that come with the cheaper strobe kits that you can get um, online and the strobes burned out so I have all of these really small soft boxes that I never really used or knew how to use in the first place and I feel like I wasted like a bunch of money when I first started. Um, so I was thinking, you know, knowing what I know now, um, and if I wanted to to go back in time, if I could go back in time rather, I don't think that I would have bought those. I think that I would have um, tried to use tools available to me to create light modifiers that would be better. Um, like making kind of like, your own light modifiers? Yeah. How do you so, do that? Um, yeah, so there's plenty, there's lots of resources online where you can make them out of PVC pipe and sheer fabric. Um, and then they pull apart too. Um, and I can actually send anybody that wants um, any you know tips or websites, some of the stuff that I found online um, to them. You can just email me at sandy at sandydurow.com and um, or you can you know Facebook in the group, whatever you need to do. Um, but yeah, basically you would you would use PVC pipe and sheer fabric, and then you could use your um, speed lights, your young nuos or whatever you have, and use that to diffuse your light. So you use PVC uh, pipe to like make a, a stretcher frame, a frame around and then you just wrap like white kind of translucent fabric uh, around it exactly exactly and it actually doesn't even look that bad and so are you making these like huge (laughs) like is that the point of this that you're making like really really big ones Mm -hmm. that's what I was thinking if I if I could go back in time I would make a really really big one and then use it like in my garage and make a studio out of my garage and then the daylight would be my softbox basically right? Instead of spending a bunch of money on something that I never even used and burned out. That's interesting. Um, I've seen people do this for car photography because obviously like, you know, a normal umbrella is way too small for shooting a car when you're shooting a car. Well, I mean, if you're, if you want the big wide shot, because you're going to see the reflection of the umbrella on the car. So like when, you know, professional is doing a a photo of a car, uh, they'll bring it into a studio and either bounce the flash off the ceiling to make it huge or some of them will have a huge like 10 foot by 20 foot softbox, which is basically just white fabric that uh, that's hung up directly over the car and then they're shooting flashes through it. So this would be a great way to do it. And it's ridiculously cheap. And um, I, I was thinking I could use it now too as like a scrim, especially in the summertime when it's really hard to get, um, you know, early morning light. Talk and scrim it's too for warm. those of us who who are <laughs> slow on the lingo. So, so a scrim is anything that you could use to block the light. So basically, you would put it over your subject if you were outside, and it would create a really nice soft light on your subject, like it was cloudy out. Cool. <laughs> And um, anyway, so that's what I just kind of started thinking about, you know, like we always say that that it's not the camera that makes the photographer. In this case, it's not the light modifier. Like there's if you can't afford a huge softbox and um, a, a, a professional level um, strobe, then use your speed light and make your own softbox. It's possible. And it's and it's very be- beautiful light, actually, from the ones that I can see. Um, so anyway, so I might try it. I might play around with it and <laughs> let you know how it goes. One little note to add on to this that I actually learned very recently is that apparently if you try and make anything like this, don't you shouldn't be using any kind of uh, shower curtains, like the plastic shower (laughs) curtains, Um, because I was thinking that would be great because they're so large. But apparently the plastic ones anyway have um, a blue fiber in it that when you use, when you shoot a light through it, it turns very, very blue on your subject. 
So you shouldn't do that. However, if you use fabrics, like any, you could use a fabric shower curtain. And that should work just fine. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> I'll just file that one away. Good to know. Right. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love the random facts. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff, you've been doing a lot of sky replacements. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. So I, I just thought I'd do it I, just because I, I did it today. Um, well, I did the processing today. So uh, last week I went and hiked up in the mountains here in Utah we went to a place called Catherine Pass. It's a good three-mile hike, like straight up the mountain. <laughs> I was huffing and puffing the way up there. But um, really beautiful view when you get up there. But I, I was up there at like 11, <laughs> 11 a.m. So the, the sun couldn't have been in a worse spot. It made for a very uninteresting photo, uh, apart from the landscape. The, land, the, the mountain scene was great. It was spectacular. It got really good detail on the scene and i just thought sat there thinking oh man this would be so great at sunset um although it would have to be sunrise with the way the mountain was anyway it would be awesome but then i thought doing this hike in the dark would not be so awesome <laughs> <laughs> and uh and i wasn't doing it anyway i was i was there with with uh friends and and we weren't there to do photography i just you know insisted on bringing my camera and taking pictures when we got there so, um, so I, I knew I, it was going to be a pretty uh, useless shot because of the, the time of day that we were up there, but I still wanted to give it a try. Then that night as I came home, there was a really great sunset that happened here uh, on the other side of the mountains. And so I captured it. Unfortunately, it happened so fast. Like I, I saw it out of my window of my house. And I went, oh my goodness, that is beautiful. So I ran out. I didn't, it was fading really fast. So I didn't have time to get a really nice composition on the shot. So, but I thought, man, this is a good sky. I could probably use it for sky replacement in another shot later. And I remembered my midday, really terrible shot of the mountain, the Catherine Pass shot. So I decided I'm going to try to put those two together. And you have, of course, a very distinct difference. You have this sunset dusk scene that was the sky that I wanted to use with this super bright midday mountain scene. And it was really fun to put those two together and edit the photo so that it made it look believable. Used um, luminosity mask to get my first selection of the sky. It still had some challenges though. There was this, uh, the blue as it fades into the background of the mountains that are really far away was too close to the blue of the sky or the luminosity of the sky. So I had a hard time grabbing those edges. So I, I used the Refine Edge tool, which is now in the latest version of Photoshop called Select and Mask and looks really different. And that may freak people out when they go into it because it looks super different. But it's the same tool and it works the same way. Also had a real challenge with that. So I, I was doing some manual um, touching up of the edges so that the difference between the sky I was putting in and the mountains didn't look fake. I uh, had to replicate some of the sky and the reflection in the water, and that's kind of fun. You select the water and then go select parts of the sky and reverse uh, trans, you know, flip it, mirror it, and, and put it down there and change the transparency and add some blur, and stuff, some things like that. So it's really fun. It's, it's a great way to learn some advanced techniques in Photoshop uh, because you have to really do a lot of work to, to make it believable, to put those two scenes together. It's a really fun exercise, and it can change. Like I had two shots that were never going to see the light of day because they were just not good shots. And when you combine them together, it makes for a really fun, far more interesting shot that I was willing to at least share on social media at that point. So lots of fun to do that. And if you haven't, um, go go give it a try. There's lots of tutorials. There's some on Improved Photography Plus if, if you want to go there. Or there's plenty out on YouTube that talk about luminosity masks and um, doing kind of this um, mixing of these two photos and layers and, and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I saw somebody in the uh, in the Facebook group who posted. Actually, I thought it was a little bit comical. Actually, somebody posted in the Facebook group, oh, oh maybe a week ago, um, that they used the sky replacement tutorial on Improved Photography Plus. And in there, um, I have one of the. I included a bunch of my my background files in there so that you can use them on your photos, and you can totally steal them. Use it on whatever photo; it's totally yours. Um, and anyway, I had a photo of a rainbow that I shot in Hawaii. Actually, I was uh, doing a shark dive with the underwater camera and I came up out of the, out of the,
the water and uh, and saw this rainbow. So I snapped a picture of it anyway. Um, and so somebody had taken that picture and put it in the in the in the sky in the background of a balloon festival, and it was a totally cool uh, sky replacement. Like it looked awesome. And, yeah. uh, and the reason I said it was comical is some, I remember somebody commented on there, like everybody commented and said, you know, great job. Looks cool. And, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like the amazing, perfect, uh, uh, sky replacement. And he even said that when he posted it, uh, but, but it looked really cool. I thought, uh, but somebody said, yeah, you know, this is, doesn't look real, whatever. Anyway. And then the same person posted a week later and, and said that it had been shared by the news or something like that. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Quit making fun of people. <laughs> I thought it was cool. Yeah. I think it did a good job one like his local papers photo of the day yeah or something like that it was yeah he did a good job that was I cool. thought. it is cool give it a try don't be afraid to go try that it will really help your, your photoshop skills very cool well in every episode of the podcast we like to leave you with a doodad of the week and uh we have a lot of them i i had to sit there for a long time trying to decide which one to share with you guys because i've been out of the podcast for a couple of weeks and so i have a uh, uh, some i'm excited to share with you but i think the one that i'm going to share today is okay it's tangentially related to photography but i think it's important <laughs> um it's this it is total wireless so i asked on my personal facebook profile um which i know a lot of you guys uh, subscribe to um anyway um so on my on my personal facebook i asked what uh what wireless provider everybody's using for your cell phone and i'm sorry for those of you who are not in the inside the united states uh but i anyway i was tired of paying the verizon tax it's just me and my wife's phones and we pay 122 dollars a month and we own the phones outright i just bought the phones uh right from the apple store so i was like 122 dollars just for the service it's nuts this is dumb uh, so I wanted to see what else was out there. And Jeff suggested um, that I look at Cricket. Cricket looks like an awesome option. What they are is they're a, a separate carrier that's just selling the service for AT&T. AT&T isn't super great in my area in Boise. Uh, Verizon kind of dominates in Idaho because we have so much rural area in Idaho. You really have to have a good provider or you're out all the time. Uh, so I wanted to stick with Verizon and uh, another friend uh, suggested uh, that I look at Walmart. Uh, and I thought, Walmart for a cell phone? But, <laughs> but I went there and I looked at their plans and Total Wireless gives you the exact coverage and speed of Verizon. There, the only real caveat is you can't like uh, use your phone as a hotspot like you can on Verizon. You have to pay extra if you're doing that. Um, but my wife and I got two phones with uh, more data um, for 60 bucks a month instead of 120 bucks a month. And the coverage is identical. I did several speed tests around town. I downloaded the speedtest.net app on phones with Verizon, and then I did it with Total Wireless exact same speeds so far same coverage uh but i'm gonna i'm anxious to see that when i get into the woods but it's using the same tower so i would assume it's the same anyway it's gonna yep. save me uh like seven or six hundred eighty dollars every year uh by switching to uh total wireless and if you run out of data um you can just spend 10 bucks and they give you uh three more gigabytes that rolls over so it's like incredibly cheap and i'm getting the basically the same service so uh i guess my suggestion is really just to check out your cell phone carrier if you're in the sticks a lot when you're doing photography it's definitely worth a, a check uh, if you're you know on t-mobile or something that doesn't have great coverage and you want coverage when you're out in the sticks shooting and you want to share stuff uh then uh check out a third party wireless dealer that is my tip. Should change it from improve photography to improve your life. That's right. I, it's tangentially related, I, right? But it saved me money. Totally. <laughs> More money to spend on camera gear. Yeah. That's right. I love it. There's your oh. angle, Jim. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, my doodad this week was, it, it's my camera bag. I've had it for the last few months. I bought into the hype and I bought the Peak Design Everyday Messenger Bag. It, it's awesome. I don't know what else to say. I mean, the little foldy tabs that they have that are advertised as being the most amazing dividers that you could ever find for a bag, they're fine. They're nothing <laughs> particularly special. But the bag itself really is very nice. It's made of very durable fabrics, and it's water-resistant. 
I can wear it in a bunch of different ways. So as it wears on one shoulder, I can wear it a different way. And I, I just am really happy with it. There's not much to say about a bag beyond it's a good bag, but this one, this one's a good bag. How much did you say it was? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it's <laughs> in the $200 range. Did you do it through Kickstarter or did you do it after? I did it through Kickstarter. Okay. I bought the hype right away because Trey Ratcliffe yeah. endorsed it. So, of course, well, he kind of helped make it. So, of course, I went and I did it. And I'm very happy with it. Um, I guess they're actually coming out with a few new designs now. They're coming out with an actual like two-strap backpack. And I'm a little bit sad now that I bought the first round. <laughs> However, I'm going to keep moving on and I'm going to keep this bag because it's a great sturdy bag that I have. It's the first time I've ever actually invested any kind of real money in a bag. And it's the first time I've been able to see a bag where I went, man, this bag is awesome. Because every other time it's just been, all right, another bag to throw stuff in. Let's, let's go. Let's throw it over me. Very cool. It looks like it's 220 bucks on their website. All right. That sounds about right. All right. Mine is going to be one that I've already shared before, but I wanted to share it again because I've been using it a ton over the last few days doing some post-processing. I go through these, these spurts. I, I'll shoot for a couple of weeks and not have time to go down and sit at the computer and, and do it. And then I'll go spend uh, several evenings and, and, and go through several hour sessions of, of doing my editing so I've been using it again. It's the Logitech MX Master Wireless Mouse. And it is not the cheapest of mice. <laughs> I think it's $60 right now on Amazon. Um, I've seen it as much as 100 though, so it's come down a little bit. And they had a deal a couple of days ago with $20 off, so maybe watch for the deal. Logitech has their stuff go up for deals on Amazon pretty regularly, so you could watch for that deal. But it's, it's the mouse I have liked the best after I tested a whole bunch of them. Uh, it fits my hand really well because it's a fairly good-sized mouse. Uh, it reduces wrist fatigue. I don't have to deal with the wrist fatigue nearly as badly. I guess the ergonomics of it and the the sensitivity of it are good so that I can I can really go through a lot of editing without it being a problem with wrist fatigue. So really nice mouse. Boy, that's cross-platform. Works on Mac and PC. Very cool. So I'm all into the really cheap doodads <laughs> right now. Um, if you start using more gels and diffusers and stuff and you're finding that like you can't really keep them organized, um, you know those plastic file folder briefcases that have the handle? Uh -huh. um, oh. They're really cheap and they keep them organized. And I'm, I apologize to the, to the audio listeners and not the, or excuse me, the, this is more of the video, but check out all of these gels. Yeah. That, yeah. Oh, so man. They're, all, they're all perfectly organized by color <laughs> and quantity. <laughs> and we keep them all in this plastic. We keep them all in this plastic briefcase and it works really well to keep them organized. Huh? That's very cool. That's a lot of gels. Did you hear, did you hear all that? Oh, we heard it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I love shooting with gels. All right, and in every episode, our new feature is the Do Random of the Week. This is, uh, well, as it explains, something totally random, has nothing to do with photography. Um, and Connor, I'm going to send this one to you. All right, so my Do Random for this week is a Roomba vacuum. I got one of these things recently, and I, I've never had cleaner floors. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the robot vacuum that turns on yeah. by itself, what goes around in your house, you know, goes the through little, the sock the drawers, disc. looks through, sends secret photos online, and then vacuums <laughs> your house, right? Yeah. <laughs> your cat can ride on it. Spy, yeah, that your cat can ride on. It's the secret spy <laughs> vacuum that, I mean, we'll say my house is getting vacuumed every day of the week now, where it was... We'll just say a lot less frequent than that before. So <laughs> while it's a pretty heavy investment to get a vacuum, it's a vacuum that's actually being used in my house. So I would say it's well worth the investment. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. Well, thanks everybody for joining us on this episode of the Improved Photography Podcast. We really appreciate your uh, your support. I will say that pay attention to improvephotography.com over the next couple weeks because I am fixing to do another one of Jim's garage sales. Uh, this will be 
the fourth annual Jim's Garage Sale. I say annual, but it's well, it's about every year, I guess. Uh, from gear that I buy to test and and just do it using different camera systems and stuff, I end up with uh, uh, kind of proliferating gear, and then I kind of purge for a while. And the other day, my wife noticed that the boxes in my office are starting to stack up again. So it is time for Jim's Garage Sale. One rule in Jim's Garage Sale: it is it has to be cheaper than the cheap cheapest one uh, used price on Amazon. So it's going to be the cheapest one you can find anywhere on the internet. Um, and uh, we put it up there. Uh, it's kind of a, a fun thing. And I know a lot of people, uh, when I when I get to workshops and stuff, are like, hey, this is your old speed lighter. This is your old tripod. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Uh, so check it out. Jim's fourth annual uh, photography garage sale. It'll be coming up sometime in the next couple weeks. Just depends when I get my boxes together and then I'll throw it uh, up on the site. So be sure to check in for that. All right. Thanks everybody for uh, listening to the podcast. Really appreciate the download and we will see you in another seven days.